about today is what we like to call the poverty mindset. And this is something that is, is all of us are affected by. And at different stages of our careers, we're able to gather up and get ourselves out of it. But the poverty mindset is what we like to call modern-day slavery. It's what is keeping us in position and, and being slaves without having chains attached to us. Now, there's a difference between being poor and broke, okay? And that difference is simple. If you have a college education, you got a job, you're trying to support your family, you have a mortgage, and through circumstances not in your control, you get laid off or whatever, some decisions happen financially where you got hit, and you lost all your money, and you wake up the next day, and you're in debt, and you have no money in the bank. You're not poor. You're broke. Because broke is a temporary situation that you can always change around by making new decisions. And for somebody in that position, they've already made decisions to make money, so they know how to make new decisions to get that back. You're just, you're just broke. And that's not a negative, and it's nothing to look down on yourself as a failure. Every single successful person in the world has failed. The people who are more successful have failed more than the people who are less successful. Donald Trump has gone bankrupt a couple of times, and he's still a billionaire. But poor, poor is a, it is a habitual, a generational, and a conditional disease. And I like to teach and I learn by telling stories. And here's a good example. Everybody remembers Katrina. And I was watching the news one day, and, and, and I cringe every single time I hear this story. But there was a woman, and this is after the Katrina uh, disaster, and the government was trying to uh, figure out how long they were going to keep subsidies going and, and the FEMA checks rolling out to people, you know, because it can't be indefinite. And what happened was you have a large section of individuals who were on welfare, not just for themselves, but their parents were on welfare, their grandparents were on welfare. They'd been on welfare since the Great Depression when the New Deal came down, generational. And what happened when Katrina hit and the FEMA checks were going out, after about a year and a half or so, the government was contemplating stopping sending the checks. And, of course, the news crews went out there to the neighborhoods and wanted to get people's response. And they found one woman, and they asked her, you know, well, well what, what do you think about the, the FEMA checks being canceled? And her response was, well, if they cancel my checks, how am I going to pay my bills and my rent? Now, <laughs> I had to stop and think for a moment. It, this is all she knows. This is all she's conditioned to know. No thought of... Maybe I need to relocate. Maybe I need to get an education. Maybe I need to do something and make new decisions so I don't have to rely on the government to bail me out because that's all she knew. And understand this. Facts and logic have absolutely nothing to do with uh, mindset. Okay? It is all emotional, it is all conditional, it's all habitual. And Barbara Bush, and many of you know her, the former first lady, she went on to Fox News, and she made this statement. She said, the Katrina incident probably is going to be the best thing for those people. Now, <laughs> she said more to that, but it got edited. But when that came out of her mouth, she was lambasted and criticized and how thoughtless, how careless, how classless can she be and insensitive to make such a statement. But I heard all of that, but I, I read into what she meant and what she was saying. Change forces us to do something different than what we've always been getting. And that statement basically meant when you're forced into a situation where you have to change, you now have an opportunity to break out of those generational, you know, habitual, poor-minded cycle. And the one constant thing in life is change. And you can never improve without change. And change can be positive and change can be negative. But how you react to that change will make all the difference. 
And when people are forced into change, more positive results happen than negative. The Great Depression, which was a, considered a negative event on American society, created the most millionaires and billionaires in any other time in history because people were forced out of their habitual habits of uh, an assembly line type of job or on the farms into learning new ways to bring an income into their household. They were forced. They had no choice. The same thing is taking place today with what they call the greatest recession since the Great Depression. People are forced out of their jobs, out of their comfort zone, out of their security, and they're forced to have to make new decisions and think of, be creative and think of new ways to be successful. So for the individuals who take advantage of that, they will prosper the most. Now here's one thing that I got from um, Success Systems for Life. And here's a, here's a, a parable that, that Fred Fitz wrote. It said, the eagle and the jellyfish are said to be composed of the same kind of cells, but one is spineless and backboneless and without stability. He drifts with the tide. The other soars to the most sublime heights, seemingly effortless, but with great strength and purpose. Which will you be? And when I read that, that really hit home to me because it's something my father said. I, I attended, uh, my father attended business school at USC, and he attended Cal State Dominguez Hills, and he was born and raised in Compton, California during a time of the, of the city, which was the, the, the poorest division in the city. And out of him and all of his neighborhood neighbors and friends growing up, he became successful. And, and what's the difference? They both came from the same environment. They all came from the same up, upbringing, the neighborhood. They all knew each other. They all had, went to the same high school, but, and they all made of the same stuff. But my father made a decision, and he made a decision that said, you know what, I'm not going to be poor. I'm going to be successful, and he acted on those decisions, but he first made a de definition of himself. He defined his purpose at a very early age that he was going to be somebody. Most people never do this. They are rolling with the tides. You ask them, what's, what's your purpose in life? Uh, I'll raise my kids and you know, enjoy Monday night football. I'll just pay the bills. You know, most people do not have a definite purpose in life. So all of you, what you must do, and you must put this down on paper, and you must define it clearly. What is your purpose what is it that you want to gain out of life? At the end of your life, you're able to look at your resume. What do you want to have down on there that you've accomplished? And you want to have a burning desire to make that happen. And once you do that, because that burning desire is an emotional response, it will separate you from everyone else that is made of the same stuff as you. This is very important. But to really also break out of this generational poor poverty mindset, and you know that it's, it's caused by uh, some of it is, is, is your, your environment, your upbringing, but you also must understand that this is something that you're going to have to need to really think long on about what it is that you want out of life, and by doing so, you're able to divine your purpose, and you're also able to be able to really put a plan in place on how to achieve you know, your, your goals and your desires. So one thing is here, a poverty mindset. So one thing when, when, you, when, you, when you're dealing with an individual that has a poverty mindset, you want to make sure that after you have your goals and everything down, now what you want to achieve out of life, then you must take action into, into making that happen. And so it comes down to a, who are you listening to? You know, you already know you were listening to your parents, you were listening to your schools, and here's a good example of make sure you listen to the right person. Like, like I said, I like to talk in stories. When I was in school at Morehouse College, I had a business professor, and I was a business major, and I wanted to be like my dad. My dad was in business. I wanted to be a business major as well. And I'm sitting there listening to the professor, and he's going over all of these macro and micro economics and charts and figures, and, 
and what things you need to do to have a million dollar and a billion dollar business. And I'm sitting there intrigued by it all and fascinated, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this guy, he knows a lot. He knows all of the, the concepts, all of the steps it takes to start your company and, and, and become a millionaire. And I asked him afterwards, I said, this guy, must, he must be a millionaire. He must have successful businesses all over the place. And so I asked him, I said, so what, what success have you had? Can you give us examples of things that you have done that back up what you're saying? Uh, well, then he talked about his backing in school, how, what, what, his degrees, his Ph.D., you know, where he studied. Oh, okay, that's fine. So after that, now that you have all that information and you put it into use, what, what companies did you start? What, what, what board of directors do you sit on? Uh, well, uh, none. I haven't, I haven't started any companies. Okay, well, what other people have you advised and you consulted on, you got a consulting fee for whatever, for giving them these great ideas for building their business? Well, uh, well no, I don't have any of that. You know, I'm a, I'm a teacher. My job is to teach you these steps to lead you to become successful. And, <laughs> and I ask, you know, that's an oxymoron. How can you lead if you haven't been there? You know, how, how can you... Tell us how to be successful if you've never been a success. And, and you know, I wasn't very popular by asking that question, and, and, and subsequently my, my, uh, I've changed programs from business to political science. So now that I'm in the political science arena, I had a chance to work in Washington, D.C. for a congressman, Congressman Jose Serrano from the Bronx. And I had an opportunity to have lunch with uh, – Congressman Patrick Kennedy. He was Ted Kennedy's son. And we were talking, and, and I was just in awe, you know, of the Kennedys, their mystique. You know, every single Kennedy born is worth $5 million on the birth canal, which is put, put into a, a trust fund that they can't touch till 21 or 25, which by that time is worth three times that amount, so that no, none of the family ever has to come out of the pocket to pass money down. This is just something that they institutionalized have done, and they've done it for 100 years, Okay. So I asked – well, he, started, he asked me questions, and he said, so you want to be a politician. You want to change the world, all that. Okay, well, you're only 21 right now. You can't even run for Congress until you're 28. You can't run for president until you're 35 or Senate until you're 35. So at least you have time to build up your, your foundation and, and, and make some money. So what's your plan? I told him, well, I'm going to graduate. Go get a job. He said, stop right there. That plan will never get you financially wealthy. You know, maybe you can be a lobbyist or go into consulting where you can make a lot of contacts and meet people who have money if you don't have money. But he said, this, where, where are you from? I said, Los Angeles. He said, this is what you want to do. There's millions of people down in Southern California, 13, 14, 15 million people. Find just 50,000 people to give you a dollar every single month. And he said, now with $50,000 a month, you don't have to worry about a job. And you can spend your time traveling, making contacts, investing in other businesses, investing in other people who, will, who may be uh, beneficial for you later on. You know, they, 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 you give them a favor, they owe you a favor, but you have the resources to do so. He said, but well, maybe if you found 20000 and gave you a dollar a day. You know, find something like that. You know, do your own business. And, they, and then he went on to talk about something else with another congressman. But I'm sure if you go back to him and ask him about that today, he would never remember that conversation. But I did, and this is before I – saw network marketing, and I understood that concept, and it, and it shed light on to, wow, I never heard of anything like that before, <laughs> I, and I spent – he gave me more wisdom in a lunch hour conversation than four years of business at Morehouse College about how to be wealthy. I never you – know, I never forget that, and taking that knowledge is what led me into network marketing, but it's the mindset of breaking that poverty cycle. And you have to understand, you know, who, who are you listening to first and foremost? So if you've made the decision, you know, on another weekend, I'm going to go over, there's four key things as far as thought process, four steps. One is the unconscious unknowing, then the conscious unknowing, then the conscious knowing, and then the unconscious knowing. And most of us 
are in that first stage of unconscious unknowing. We don't know that we don't know. That's poverty mindset. We have no clue. But once we, are, are, once we have been enlightened, once we have, the door has been opened to a, a complete another way, now we are conscious that we don't know anything. Now we know we don't know anything. And what this system that you guys are plugging into in this training and self-improvement and personal development, what that is doing is bringing you consciously aware that there is a different way than what you've been doing for all of your life. See, there's a couple of things you must understand. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, yet expecting a different result. In other words, if you continue to do the things you have always done, you will continue to have what you have always gotten. So that's something that you must understand. So now that you know, you know that there's things that, that you, don't, you, do, you don't know. A couple of questions you're going to have to ask yourself is, number one, is what is your willing, willingness to learn new things? What's your willingness to learn? And what is your willingness to accept change? See, when Barbara Bush made that statement, she was talking about the change, not the results, but the change happening. And if people are willing to accept change instead of trying to force things to go back to the way that they always were, then that can be the best thing that can ever happen to you. She said it all wrong, and it came out all wrong, but that's what she meant. There wasn't anything racist about it, and, and I, I'm not backing whether Barbara Bush is one thing or not, but the statement itself was on point. So what is your willingness to learn? And that's what Melvin's talking about the system. If you are willing to learn, then you must plug into the system. And what is your willingness to accept change? Because when you undergo this process, you will change. Your environment will change. You will start to attract different people in your life, but it also works in reverse. You will start to eliminate people that are already in your life out of your life. Right now, I guarantee the five closest people around you, you all have the same bank account size. You all drive the same type of cars. You all have the same type of lifestyle. The way law of attraction works is you attract to you what you are and what you put out. And it, if you want something more, if you want something different, then you need to start thinking differently, acting differently, and when you do so, you start to attract things into your life that are what you want. And, it, and it's like a magnet, and it's also the reverse. You start to eliminate those things that, that you don't, and most people don't get this. And I see on the Internet all the time people are running their mouths about law of attraction this, law of attraction that, and they really have no clue because, number one, they're focusing on you know, technique. These are the things that, that you have to do. When it's more about an emotional feeling, an emotional desire for what you want, it's not all about the how am I going to make it happen, but it's what it is that you want. You have it clearly defined. You think about it all the time. You know, uh, was it, uh, Earl Nightingale and Napoleon Hill both made statements about you. what you think about you become most of the time, or thoughts are things. But w you don't have to understand the law of attraction because all of you are already doing it anyway. What you have in your life right now, you attract it to you. It also works negatively. If you're thinking bad things all the time, then bad things are always going to come to you. If you have a poverty mindset, you are already unconsciously unconscious that you think about bad things all the time. You don't even realize that you're doing it, and you're very good at doing it, and you will attract those things in your life. So number one, you've got to be open. You, know, you now know that you don't know anything. So you have to be open to realize change is coming my way. Will I accept it? Will I soar like the eagles? Or will I just float around the pond and go with the flow of whatever happens to me? You know, you can, the best thing I like to do when you see change coming is make that change happen yourself. Make the change. There is no, no uh, course that's already been done in front of us. We are creating it. Everything you see is all of us creating this. And we already know what our goal is and what we want to happen. We're going to have 100,000 people in this company. 
That's our goal. Now we are making it happen. But if we don't state that goal, we may end up with 2,000. You know, you, you, you're, you're moving around aimlessly. But to go back to the poverty mindset, to overcome this as well, because now you know, you, and you may think to yourself, I don't have a poverty mindset. Well, are you wealthy? No, you have a poverty mindset. And like I said, it's not negative against you. It's just where you are right now. And how to change that is also you need to be studious readers. You must read, read, read. There's a reason, you go back to before the Civil War, why reading was banned. Slaves were not allowed to read because reading gave them ideas. Reading helped them to realize there's more than what they already are and what they have. Now that reading is not illegal, people don't read. Most adults, and after they get out of school, never pick up a book outside of a magazine article or the next Martha Stewart type book, anything like that, but they don't read. We always suggest more books to read, and you always want to read constantly. You don't have to read, sit down and read for three or four hours, 30 minutes a day. Pick up something and read it. Listen to tapes. Listen to audio tapes. You know, I have, uh, I just got a brand new Evo, and it's got eight gigabytes of memory. I just downloaded that sucker with about seven gigabytes of memory and one gigabyte of music. So people, you know, when they see me walking around with the headphones in my ear, they think I'm listening to music, and I'm not. I'm listening to audio tapes. I'm listening to motivational speakers. I'm listening to ways of learning ideas on how to better myself. And what happens is, you know, Melvin said I'm a master at, at the um, self-attraction. Uh, I'm not a master. I'm learning. I'm, o- I'm, I'm always wanting to learn more, but it's easier to attract people that's like-minded to you, and, and it's starting to come easier. It's not easy, but it's easier. Not as hard as it was when I first got started. And it's getting easier every single week, because every single week you're growing, and you're learning more. I just reread uh, Think and Grow Rich uh, last week, and the, and the time I read it before that was probably four or five years ago, and the time before that, four years before that. And each time I read it, I got something more out of it, and I also realized there's still a whole lot missing to Think and Grow Rich, which is why the experts are talking about Law of Success in 16 Lessons, which is Napoleon Hill's first work, which was banned. The wealthy people banned it because he told all the secrets, and they didn't want that stuff out. Think and Grow Rich is a watered-down version. But if you're just starting out, you can't go to master level without taking the beginning steps. But I encourage you to read both of those books, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill and also Law of Success and 16 Lessons. Now, the language, remember these books were, were written 80 years ago. And so some of the things that they talk about, some people today may not be able to really uh, equate to or relate to. But for those of you, if you're an African American, Dennis Kimbrough wrote a book that's called Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice. He wrote that one, I think it was the late 80s and 90s. Go and get that book. It's also an excellent book. Get How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Because you are in this relationship business, you are going to be attracting people to you. So here's a way to learn how to be a better person yourself, To not to go out there and find people, but you will be attracting people. So you want people to start coming up to you. Hey, what, is it, what, is, what are you doing? How can I be a part of that? You know, I want to learn more about it. As I recruit, I, I never talk about my business. I always ask people questions about what it is that they want out of life. And that way I'm able to rate where they are on that poverty scale, if they're big thinkers or not. So these are the things that you want to be able to do to better yourself first. You cannot recruit other people who have a poor mindset and a poverty mindset until you eliminate yours. It's just not going to work. So I hope that this was great information for you guys to really go on. I'm looking at my notes here, and it's still it's a whole day's worth of stuff to go over. And uh, I just wanted to give you just a, a, a simple, basic breakdown, and I'm going to end with this. You're out there recruiting, and you're going to be dealing with people who may even come off as successful, 
but they're listening to the wrong people, and they still have a poverty mindset. The facts and logic don't matter. You, you can show somebody, and let's just say, for example, there's another person that's in another company, and they're all excited about their company, and, and they're hyped up on it, and they think it's the greatest thing on the planet. And then you show them some facts to contradict what they're saying, that, hey, your company really isn't paying out that much money. If you look at our compensation plan here, you will see that nothing can touch it. No, there's no competition. They can read this and still come back to you and say, it doesn't meet my criteria. <laughs> it's amazing. Why? Because, they, they, one, they never had an open mind, and they're so closed on what they're doing because they have an emotional attachment to what they're doing. So how to reach this type of a person is not by showing them that our compensation plan is the best, but by finding out what it is that they're trying to get out of life from what they're currently doing, and then finding out if what they're doing is going to make it happen for them. Let them discover the flaws in it. Now, this is one thing that I'm, I'm practicing every time I'm talking to people. I haven't mastered it yet, but I'm practicing because I know if they are so emotionally tied to their operation, nothing I can tell them is going to sway them. So what I need them to do is see the fallacies of what they're doing. And you'll be amazed. I, had a, I talked with a guy who's in MDT, and he was so pumped up about it, and then and the product was so great and fantastic. It cost $400 to get started and $50 a month. And I asked him, okay, how much money will I make with 100 people on my team in that? Uh, uh, well, there's like five ways to get paid, nine ways to get paid. Okay, okay. How much money would I make if, my, if I brought in 100 people who paid $400? Um, let me get you on the line with my upline, and he can, he can, he can tell you. Well, well, you know what? He, he's not available, but my upline has 900 people. Okay, if he has 900 people on his team, how much money residually is he making? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. I said, well, don't you think if you are invested all this money and this time into this operation, you would at least know how much money you would make if you met certain goals? He said, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I said, so don't you find it kind of odd that you don't know and that you may even be afraid to ask your upline how much money they are actually making? Isn't that a little bit odd to you? Yeah, I said, that doesn't really make business sense, does it? No, it, no, it doesn't. You know, you ask questions you already know the answer to. And then, then I come back saying, well, that's an operation that I can't even – if you don't know what's going on, even if you put me on the upline, I know he's going to say the same thing. Then I, I know what I'm doing here. I know 100 people on my team is $10,000 a month. I know so, – so it wouldn't make sense for me to really look at what you're doing. Now, I told him about what I'm doing indirectly, and that's what I'm practicing and really getting good at. But these are skills that you, you learn on how to combat the poverty mindset of individuals. And it is not about logic or emotion, I mean, logic or facts, because when the mind is right, facts don't matter. It doesn't matter. It does, the people who, who – successful people – done things that people already said were impossible to do. Why? Because they were too stupid to know it was impossible. They didn't care. It doesn't matter what the facts say. I'm going to do it anyway because I believe I can do it. So the facts don't matter. You've got to have a belief and an emotional bond to your desire and your why and focus on it and work on it on a daily basis.